All right, let's look at some examples of how to actually perform hypothesis tests for the mean, but using the stats calculator to actually compute the p-values that we're interested in. So to test a hypothesis about a mean, first thing that's really important is just knowing that this is what you're supposed to do. So identify the hypothesis statement in the problem, and just ensure that it involves something about an average or a mean. Uh, it should be pretty clear, but you know this is the first thing you want to look for. Students are often programmed to scan for numbers when they approach a, a word problem, but it, it's the context from the actual words that is really important to know what you're supposed to do to solve it. So once you identify that, then you can move forward. We will need to make sure uh, the central limit theorem is met in order to test a hypothesis for the mean. And what that means is that either we need to have a sample size that's greater than 30 so that we have the sampling distribution uh, is approximately normal, or that the data itself, uh, the population that is, uh, was originally normally distributed to begin with. We can have a small sample as long as the original population was normally distributed. Then we have to decide when we're doing a hypothesis test for the mean which distribution we're going to use. And our cho choices here are the normal distribution or the t-distribution. The normal distribution is going to be used if the standard population standard deviation happens to be known, which is an uncommon thing. So for the most part, we would be using the t-distribution uh, with degrees of freedom that are one less than our sample size, uh, since we generally do not know the population standard deviation. And once we have created our hypothesis and we need to calculate a p-value, like I said, we're going to use technology to do that. Uh, there's two functions in your online stats calculator that can calculate p-values. One is called t-test of a mean, and the other one is z-test of a mean. The t indicating the t-distribution being used, and the z indicating that the normal distribution is being used. So let's take a look at some examples here. So first off, we have an advertisement of a pizza delivery company that states that its mean delivery time for all pizzas is 30 minutes. And you think that this is, this is actually more than this and form a random sample of 35 delivery times, the mean of which is 31.8 minutes and the standard deviation is 4.7 minutes. Use this sample data to test the claim that the mean delivery time is more than 30 minutes using a level of significance of 5%. Okay, so we are being asked to test a claim. So that's the first thing that indicates that we're going to do a hypothesis test. We're going to first need to figure out what our hypothesis is. And here we have two competing statements. We have this advertisement uh, stating that the mean delivery time is 30 minutes. And then we have, you know, ourselves who is testing this and under the belief that the mean delivery time is actually more than 30 minutes. So these are competing statements and one of them has to be true. We have to decide which one it is. So they form together our hypothesis. One will be known as the null hypothesis and the other will be the alternative hypothesis. The null hypothesis is the current state of the situation or the status quo. So here we have the advertisement stating that the mean delivery times is 30 minutes. So that's really the current state here. The claim that we're testing is that the mean delivery time is actually more than 30 minutes. So our claim is that the population mean is more than 30. Now that gives us a right-tailed test, and um, we use that in calculating a p-value. 
Okay, now before we get into that process, uh, notice we also have some sample data. So we have a sample of 35 delivery times, so that's a sample size. The mean of the sample is 31.8 minutes, and the standard deviation is 4.7 minutes. All right. Now, if we look at this, 31.8 is larger than 30, but that's not enough to form a conclusion because the standard deviation is 4.7, and this is only a sample of 35 delivery times. It's not an entire population, so it, we can't really draw a conclusion just on the mean of this sample alone. So um, here's what we need to do. So in order to calculate a p-value, so that's the st second step in our process here. So in order to calculate a p-value, what we need to do is this. We have to first standardize our statistic. So we take our uh, statistics and we plug them into this formula right here. So the test statistic is the mean of our sample minus the mean of the population divided by our sample standard deviation over the square root of n. All right, and we make the assumption that the mean in the population is our mean from the null hypothesis. So this makes this probability like uh, conditional. So on the condition that this statement is true, we're looking for the probability that these sample statistics were produced. So to standardize things, we just use our t-score formula, which is essentially a z-score formula. But we have 31.8 minus 30 divided by our sample standard deviation of 4.7 over the square root of uh, 35. All right, now you can do this computation uh, in the stats calculator, but again, I'm going to show you, um, well, let's go ahead and compute it actually. So uh, when we do a computation, we just work here in this main screen. Um, Let's go ahead and find out what this is. So 31.8 minus 30 divided by 4.7 over the square root of 35. So we get a test statistic value of 2.27. Okay. So I'm going to write that down. And then the p-value, it's a probability. So we have a t distribution, and we're on a standard t distribution here, because I standardized my data at 2.27. The mean is in the center at 0. Here's 2.27. Now the number of degrees of freedom that we have is one less than our sample size, which would be 34. So I'm using right-tailed test because the symbol used in the alternative hypothesis is a greater than. So I want to calculate the area to the right of this test statistic. The area to the right of that test statistic is my p-value. And I could compute this. I could compute this using, uh, if I went to the distributions menu, students t, um, on a standard, so 0 and 1, that's great. The degrees of freedom are 34. And I'm going to do an area to the right. And it's 2.27 that I'm interested in. That's probably easier just to type that in. And I get 0 0.015. Okay. And I wanted you to see where all this is coming from. But ultimately, this is happening in the background. What you're going to do here, whenever you want a p-value using a uh, t-distribution, 
you are going to go to a different location here. So there's a menu called tests. And if you hover over that, you get Z test of amine, T test of amine, Z test of a proportion, and then you have tests for two means uh, and proportions. But we are interested in T test of amine, as we decided that we're using the T distribution. And it's kind of a convenience thing. So the null hypothesis is that the mean is equal to 30, and the alternative is that it's greater than 30, so just choose the greater than sign. The sample mean is 31.8. The sample standard deviation is 4.7. And our sample size is 35. Oh, and I don't know if I stated it, but the central limit theorem uh, is satisfied here because we have that large sample. Uh, that's always a good thing to check. Once we've inputted all of that, these four values is all the calculator needs to get your test statistic and then the direction of the probability to get the p-value. And so it goes ahead and it computes those things for you. So we have the test statistic is 2.27, like we said, and the p-value of 0 0.015. This is ultimately what I expect you're using when you're doing these um, from here forward. So 0 0.015. Now, once you have that p-value, it's time to make a decision. So the decision is made by taking our p-value and comparing it to the level of significance of the test. Here, the level of significance is 5%. The p-value is 1.5%. Um, changing them both to percentages because they have to be either both decimals or both percentages. But the percentages are nicer because sometimes you eliminate a couple of uh, leading zeros. Makes the percentage, uh, the, the comparison easier. Now, the p value is less than alpha. And my rule is if p is low, the null must go. So if the p value is less than alpha, we reject the null hypothesis. All right, so that's our third step. The fourth step is to interpret this. So we say at alpha equals blank, there is blank enough evidence. To support the claim, and it's good to go ahead and restate the claim. All right, so we just need to fill in these blanks. So at alpha equals 5%. So just restate your level of significance because if this had been 1%, we would have failed to reject the null hypothesis. So it really matters what your level of significance is as to what your interpretation is. All right, so because we rejected the null hypothesis, we say there is sufficient. So at alpha equals 5%, there's sufficient evidence. Oh, I guess I don't need enough in there. <laughs> sufficient evidence to support the claim that the mean delivery time is more than 30 minutes. So ultimately, uh, because we rejected the null hypothesis, we said this statement right here is false, which leads this statement to be true. So uh, the claim is that the mean delivery time is more than 30 minutes. So we're supporting that particular claim. All right, a college pamphlet indicates that the average textbook price is $100. A graduate student thinks the real value is more than this and conducts a random study of 45 new textbooks and found the average cost to be $105.68 with a standard deviation of $19.70. Based on this sample, test the claim that the textbooks cost more than $100 on average using a level of significance of 1%. Okay, so the competing statements here. We have this college pamphlets uh, indicating the average textbook price is $100. But then, you know, the 
claim here is that it's actually more than $100. So those competing statements make up our hypothesis. And whatever the status quo is, is the null hypothesis. So that is going to be that the textbook price average is $100. The competing hypothesis, the alternative that is, is that the claim is actually, or that the average is actually more than that, giving us a right-tailed test. Okay, now um, we need to decide between, uh, or the next thing to do is to get the p-value. So we're going to need to decide between using a normal distribution or a t-distribution. And in this case, the standard deviation provided is a sample standard deviation. So we would be using the t-distribution. But we also need to make sure that the central limit theorem is satisfied. Um, and we have a sample size here of 45 textbooks, which is greater than 30, so that's fine. All right, so we'll just use the calculator here to uh, come up with our p-value. So the value in the null hypothesis is 100. We have a right-tailed test again. The mean of the sample is 105.68. The standard deviation was 1970. Sample size was 45, I believe. And we press calculate and we get the test statistic is 1.93 and a p-value of 0 0.03 when rounded to two decimals. Well, I rounded to three decimals, but it's 030 technically. Now, that leads us to making a decision. So to make the decision, we compare our p-value uh, to the alpha level and the alpha level in this case is 1%. The p-value, written as a percentage, is 3%. So the p-value is bigger than alpha. And the rule is, if p is low, the null must go. So in this case, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. So at alpha equals 1%, there is... And then here, because we failed to reject the null hypothesis, we put insufficient. Insufficient evidence uh, to support the claim that textbooks cost more than $100 on average. All right, one more example. A travel magazine states that the average cost of a hotel room in Atlanta is $165 per night. You think the real value is different from this and select a random sample of 18 hotel rooms and find the average cost is $187.43 with a standard deviation of $38.19. Using alpha equals 5%, test the claim that the average hotel cost is different from $165. You may assume the, the cost of a hotel room in Atlanta is normally distributed. So we have this magazine stating that the average cost is $165. But then we have a claim that the average cost is different from that. So those are competing statements for which we need to test. The statement that the average cost is $165, that's going to be our status quo, or the current statement, current state of the situation. And the claim is that the hotel cost is actually different from that. And it's not greater than or less than particularly, just not equal to. So it's different from 165. It could be either direction. Now, that makes a two-tailed test, but that's OK. The uh, calculator knows how to do a p-value for a two-tailed test. We just have to indicate that in the uh, statement. But before we get started using the calculator, 
we first need to decide between a Z test and a T test. And in this particular case, population standard deviation is unknown. So that's going to be a T test that we would use. And in addition to that, um, we need to make sure that the central limit theorem is satisfied. So we have a sample size of 18, which is a small sample, but the original population is normally distributed. So that's okay. So central limit theorem is satisfied, we can proceed here. So the null hypothesis is 165. This is a two-tailed test. The average is 187.43. The standard deviation is 38.19. The sample size was 18. And let's go ahead and calculate. So we have a test statistic of 2.49 and a p-value of 0 0.023. And we'll use that in making our decision. So the p-value here is 2.3%. And alpha, we are using 5% in this particular case. So the p-value is less than alpha. If p is low, the null must go. So at alpha equals 5%, there is sufficient evidence to support the claim that the average hotel cost is different from $165.